from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, stocks slide on a Bloomberg scoop that Apple plans to slow hiring and spending. We've got the inside details on how the iPhone maker plans to deal with the downturn. Plus, Netflix says its latest season of Stranger Things was even bigger than expected. But can Netflix deliver in its earnings report this week after a dismal start to the year? Stranger Things have happened. And Bitcoin rallies jumping as much as 7% to hit $22,000 for the first time in weeks. What's driving the crypto rebound later this hour? We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the market. Stocks took a leg down after a Bloomberg scoop that Apple plans to slow hiring and spending, cutting back on a normally aggressive R&D budget. Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs here to walk us through the day. Taylor. Emily, and you were so right. Equity markets were green on the screen, and then about 10 minutes before 2 o'clock when I went on air, all of this started to unravel with that great headline that you just mentioned. And so, of course, you end up lower on the day, and you see there, of course, the NASDAQ 100 off about 9 tenths of 1%, certainly the big underperformer on that big Apple news. I know that you'll circle back and get to that in just a moment. You have a 10-year yield as well that does continue to climb. So recession fears, at least not today, more about some of those inflationary, reflationary growth stories. I want to change up the board because I wanted to talk about IBM as well that came just after uh, the closing bell here. You're off about 4%. Emily, I guess overall the top line numbers look good. They didn't really mention a ton of headwinds when it came to the dollar, but I still think some concerns here when it comes to how we're thinking about all the tech spend that you mentioned and how we're thinking about these companies navigating some of these recessionary challenges that are maybe coming up on us. Finally, of course, let's just broaden out and take a look at some of the individual stock sectors. I know that you mentioned Netflix. Now, after hours, you're up about 1%. Stranger Things, too scary for me. I can't watch it. Alphabet, <laughs> 20 for one stock split. That I could do any day. We could talk about that all day long. Disney, there is a great story as well that we talked about. I think getting $9 billion in upfront ads, 40% of those online. And so Disney, of course, as we sort of push forward to the uh, sort of um, uh, uh, earnings results that we're going to get, of course, starting with Netflix and the streaming environment. Finally, Apple. I mean, just unbelievable, the story of the day. You're off 2%. I think one of the biggest one-day declines that we've had now going back in, in a few weeks here, Emily. All right, Taylor, thank you. Now, as Taylor mentioned, Apple plans to slow hiring and spending growth next year in some divisions. This according to Bloomberg sources. Apple is still planning an aggressive product launch schedule in 2023, including potentially a new mixed reality headset. But this news about typically recession-resistant Apple taking investors by surprise. Mark Gurman broke the story and joins us now. So, Mark, what exactly have you learned about Apple's plans? Emily, thank you for having me. We learned that the company going into fiscal 2023 is taking a more cautious approach to its investing and spending when it comes to hiring. So you're going to see upon some departures over the next year or so, normal attrition, maybe Apple won't fill some of those roles in, in order to save a little bit money, uh, money and be cautious there. You're probably going to see them have headcount even in many teams instead of upgrading their headcount maybe between 5 and 10 and 15%. You're also going to see them spending a little bit less money in certain divisions as well. This is all in preparation for this looming recession we've talked about many times and this economic downturn that people are concerned about coupled with inflation. So uh, talk to us about why the market is so surprised by this or concerned by this, given that Apple, you know, weathered the pandemic pretty well, also kind of a bellwether for consumer sentiment. I think that's exactly right. Because Apple is a bellwether, right, I think that the market and analysts and people who invest trust Apple to make decisions ahead of time. If you remember when COVID-19 started to happen in the beginning of 2020, Apple was one of the first to sort of take a stand and begin closing their stores and begin putting measures in and begin talking about that potential impact, right? So Apple has shown that it has good insight and good research to understand when economic situations are going to happen. So I think the market knows that 
and traded based on that. At the same time, I don't think it's hugely surprising given that you've seen Meta and Tesla and Amazon and Microsoft all make similar moves. The difference is, is that Apple is going to try to keep that internal. Instead of Tim Cook sending out a memo to the entire company detailing their plans for 2022 and 2023 when it comes to this economic downturn, they are not going to announce that publicly, right? That's why we're reporting it based on sources, just like you've seen other companies do, right? Apple doesn't seem to appear to believe that they're going to have a major impact on consumers because of this or employees. You're probably not going to see layoffs here. You're probably not going to see major changes to their product pipeline and their launch plans. Uh, like you mentioned, I am still expecting the announcement of the first major new product category in eight years, a mixed reality headset to happen sometime in 2023. There's also going to be big iPhone updates next year, big Apple Watch updates, a larger iPad, many new Macs. So there's a lot in store for next year. The company still wants to get out to consumers. Meantime, Mark, there's uh, another story you're following. Apple being sued over pay and antitrust violations. Explain to us what's happening here. This one's a long time coming. So basically, the way the iPhone works with Apple Pay is that Apple is the only company that can have tap to pay software on the phone. So you know how you want to go to Whole Foods or another place and you tap your phone on the reader to make a payment? That's only through Apple Pay. So that means that Square, PayPal, Chase, Amex, any financial provider, you name it, they're not able to develop their own application uh, in order to use the NFC chip, near field communications chip that allows tap to pay on the iPhone. So now you see this consortium of payment companies through this class action lawsuit to benefit consumers, right? That is happening now. They're upset that Apple is keeping that feature exclusive to its own service and then charging what they say are higher than normal rates uh, for consumers to use that. And those rates obviously being passed on uh, to the payment processing companies. Okay, Mark Gurman, we'll keep the scoops coming. Thanks so much, uh, Thank as you. always, for joining us. Coming up, will the metaverse really change life as we know it? My next guest says yes, indeed, and big time. He will tell us how next. This is Bloomberg. couple of decades, today's internet will undergo a multi-trillion dollar transformation to an interconnected 3D virtual world currently known as the metaverse, or so some tech futurists say. Think virtual malls where we shop, play, work, and more, all under the same roof. In his new book, The Metaverse and How It Will Revolutionize Everything, Apillion Co. Managing Partner Matthew Ball offers a glimpse into this new reality. Matthew joins us now from LA. So Matthew, the question is when? So much of the progress that has been made on the so-called metaverse so far seems to be pretty basic. When are our lives going to be quote unquote revolutionized? Well, so we should keep in mind that these technological transformations do take decades. I'm glad that you emphasize that. The first wireless cell phone call in 1973, the first data-based wireless network 91, smartphones 92, the early 2000s, we get the first consumer media services on mobile devices, Blackberries thereafter, the iPhone, some way through the next decade, most of the world was running on mobile and cloud services. What's clear now is that the advent of real-time 3D, as we talk about it in industrial applications, the advent of XR in live patient surgery, and the fact that hundreds of millions of people, typically under the ages of 25, are all living in 3D worlds today. So not you or me yet, no offense. Talk to us then about how this is going to change our daily lives. For example, you know, you, you're joining us now remotely. Would it seem like you were here in the studio in this new world? That's certainly one element. We see this in particular emphasized by Meta where they talk about the idea of co-location and presence in virtual space. But in some instances, we will just be using some of the devices we have right now, but we might be doing those in 3D, what we call volumetric displays or holography. You and I might be sitting thousands of miles apart looking at a screen, but the actual presentation would be in 3D. And studies show that that has remarkable improvements on retention, engagement, nonverbal forms of communication. 
Now, you've had your Metaverse ETF now going for several months. You've got you know, names like Meta in there, not surprising. Also Snap, which I found interesting because Snap's view of the Metaverse is so different from Meta is where, you know, Evan Spiegel has called Mark Zuckerberg's vision so hypothetical and Snap is betting more on, you know, more sort of augmented reality over real physical reality. And today Snap unveiled a new web version of Snap, which almost seems like it's going backwards. How do we square these two visions? The way that we square it is by ignoring the term altogether. It's helpful to talk about a new generation of the internet but you'll find that because there's no concrete definition, some believe that it fundamentally requires crypto, others have VR-centric beliefs, others have augmented reality-centric beliefs. Under the classical definition where we're talking about real-time 3D, all of those are likely to fit in one way, shape, or form. Evan might talk about augmented reality lenses. Mark Zuckerberg might talk about a virtual world with all of your other vision cut off that's still 3D, and they're still going to interconnect in some way, shape, or form. Now, let's talk about how this changes the world of streaming. You know, you were a longtime former Amazon studio executive. You know, how, how does this change the way we watch and what we watch and how? So this is a great example of the fact that we're already sitting in parts of this world today. Disney, of course, produced most of The Mandalorian using a game engine, a real-time 3D simulation engine. That meant that they could create the perfect sunset. They could hold that sunset in place. They can pull out the entirety of that virtual set, reshoot it in five years, or make it available to you and I on our Peloton, on a video game console, in virtual or augmented reality. That's one of the ways in which we're gonna to start to see entertainment change. You've seen that the Match CEO now comes from Zynga, and he, in his new role, is talking about the idea that you might be able to traipse Tatooine on a date rather than just play games from a smartphone. Now, Netflix earnings are coming up. We've been talking a lot about the success of Stranger Things, which is not necessarily a surprise, even though it's scarier and more gruesome than the last three seasons. I'm still watching it. Um, what would you bet is going to happen here? Do you think they're going to buck the trend that we saw earlier this year? Are we going to see a slow... Uh, degradation in the number of subscribers for a while. It's clear by all streaming benchmarks that Stranger Things season four was as exceptional as the fans hoped and in, in excess of what Netflix did. But also third party analytics show that a lot of the subscriber additions are weaker than we would have hoped for. And in particular, churn looks worse. Antenna, a subscription analytics and data company, shows that Netflix now ranks second last in terms of subscriber retention after 30 days from sign up. They're also at a four year high for the overall services churn and retention. And so the numbers basically say that even if it was a pretty strong quarter for ads, the churn elevation is likely to offset them and more. Lord of the Rings, uh, the new series, Jeff Bezos tweeted out the trailer last week. Do you think it's gonna be a, a mega hit like Stranger Things has been for Netflix? Stranger Things came out in 2016 and it's still breaking records seven years later. Defining by that degree is going to take some time, but do I think that it's going to premiere to outstanding viewership globally, that it's going to cover the press, that it's going to be one of the most significant things that Amazon overall does in 22? Absolutely. So uh, what's your take on the overall tech market dynamics? You know, we've got this negative news out from Apple that they're gonna slow down spending growth, that they're gonna slow down hiring Apple you know, long considered a bellwether for consumer sentiment. Mm -hmm. Are you taking that as a signal, a bad signal uh, for the rest of big tech for the foreseeable future? It's not encouraging, certainly. When you take a look at how many other creators, founders, products and services rely on the iPhone and the incremental improvements from every device refresh, none of that's good. But we're seeing this industry-wide separate from Apple. The video game industry was down 19% year over year last month. Year to date, it's trending at 11% year over year. And so we're looking at a you know, broad situation where consumer electronics, entertainment, leisure, high-end GPUs from NVIDIA are all getting compressed. The drop in the crypto markets is exacerbating that on a demographic basis. All right, uh, Matthew, always good to have you here and excited about your new book, The Metaverse and How It Will Revolutionize Everything Out Tomorrow, wherever you get your books. Matthew Ball of Apillion. Thank you.
Coming up, could Elon Musk's bid for Twitter somehow be good for Twitter's relationship with China? Our next guest thinks so. Strategy Risks founder and CEO Isaac Stonefish is back to talk to us about the future of China-US tech relations and more. This is Bloomberg. maker of batteries for electric cars is considering at least two locations in Mexico for a manufacturing plant. China's contemporary Amperex technology could be positioning itself to help Tesla and Ford grow their EV market share in North America. The potential sites are near the Texas border, according to Bloomberg sources, and the company is planning to invest as much as $5 billion in this project. Meantime, China is facing a slew of new challenges as its economy buckles amidst stringent COVID-0 policies. There are ongoing protests at housing projects, for example, in more than 50 cities, with residents refusing to pay their mortgage payments. And typically vibrant Hong Kong is struggling to recruit and retain new talent. So how will this all impact the tech sector? I want to bring in Isaac Stonefish, the founder and CEO of Strategy Risks, that works with companies to assess their risk exposure to China, and thank you. It's been, it's been a while, Isaac, so good to have you back here on the show. I mean, when you look at China right now, is it still a good place to put your money? I think it depends what better options you have, and certainly there's a lot of other places in the world, a lot of other industries, a lot of other sectors that have more minimal China exposure. I think for so long, people have been mispricing the risk of investments in China, and now that the risks are so much more clear, they're able to step back and say, oops. Right. Is the center of gravity in the tech scene moving? Is it moving from you know, Beijing to Hong Kong or from Hong Kong to Singapore, for example, where conditions are more predictable? I think a lot of people in the tech scene like the idea of it being decentralized, especially the more Bitcoin-y of the mm -hmm. folks. I think the China certainly is the center of the tech scene in Asia, but it's really too early to say whether or not they can ever have a global tech scene. I mean, Chinese entrepreneurs have long succeeded despite the Chinese Communist Party and despite the conditions of China as opposed to because of. And as their space grows narrower and narrower, I think we are going to see more of an exodus of talent to other parts of the world. And do you think the COVID policies will have a long-term impact? Like, will this be an inflection point? I think it definitely could be. There, there's a metaphor going around China of the guy stepping on someone else's neck and a lot of people going around thinking, okay, well, how do we get this guy to breathe? What can we do? What can we do? And mm. the solution is take your foot off the neck. Mm. So it's been a long period of strangulation of China's economy. There's huge emotional damages of the cruel lockdown that they've had. And yeah, I think that'll have really long-term effects. Meantime, you've got companies like TikTok, for example, just continuing to thrive. And obviously, you know, parent company is ByteDance. And do you think that U.S. tech companies, U.S. social media companies will ever be able to catch up? I think they TikTok. will. I, I think they certainly might. And I think the the game that TikTok is playing is how can it seem as un-Chinese as possible in the United States? And the more it gets tarred with its association with the Chinese Communist Party, the better it will be for Meta and Google and Microsoft and frankly even Oracle. So you have some interesting uh, analysis on this whole Elon Musk Twitter debate in that you think that Elon Musk's potential involvement in Twitter or, you know, the drama in general could be good for Twitter's relationship with China, which is interesting given that Twitter has been blocked in China since 2009 or 2010 when I was living there. Um, what do you mean? Musk, for someone who's such a free speech avatar, has this massive blind spot when it comes to China and refuses to criticize China or the Chinese Communist Party in a way that's especially egregious for someone who's so open and no holds barred with so many other people. And it feels like employees of Twitter will read between the lines or will listen to directives that say, 
okay, we don't need to be so aggressive in labeling uh, Chinese accounts linked to state media. We don't need to push back against this kind of information. We don't need to see this as misinformation. And hey, Tesla's in China. Why can't Twitter be in China? Mm. And make a lot of the ethical sacrifices that Musk has made vis-a-vis -vis Tesla in China. Interesting. So you think if Elon Musk takes over Twitter and does the deal, as he promised, that it could be an entree for Twitter back into China? I think it certainly can be. Now, I don't think that's necessarily going to be good for Twitter's bottom line. It'll certainly change the way the social media platform works. I think we see Tesla on one side, which is heavily exposed to China. We have SpaceX on the other side, which is heavily hived off from China. You have Musk and other board members linking them. And I think Twitter will fit somewhere in between. But I think it's possible that they might fit closer to the Tesla model than the SpaceX model. And how optimistic are you about the future of Tesla in China, especially given all of these broader economic concerns? I think it depends on how far Musk is willing to bend. And there's a lot of concerns in China about Tesla as a national security threat because of all the data that it collects. Mm -hmm. And I assume that Musk will be very happy to continue yielding to the Chinese Communist Party with sharing data, with doing things like opening a showroom in Xinjiang, the region in northwest China where upwards of a million Muslims have been in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. I think we'll continue to see similar behavior. I think that, frankly, the thing that would be most likely to change it if Musk decides to be more heavily involved with politics in the United States and thinks, well, this is just too much of a liability for me, but I don't see that as very likely. This along with concerns about TikTok and how TikTok handles data of its users and whether or not it's shared with the Chinese government. What's your take? No question that it, that it can be shared with the Chinese government. There's no way. I, I think what people need to understand, and this maybe transitions to another even darker topic, but if the U.S. and China go to war over Taiwan or islands in the East Sea or the South Sea or Vietnam or any other country in the region, all of Chinese companies and U.S. companies will be viewed by some as enemy combatants. Mm -hmm. And the threat with TikTok is less that someone's using TikTok in New Jersey and the Chinese Communist Party is watching that in real time. But the way that that data, that information, that location tracking can be weaponized if Beijing so chooses. Dark indeed. Uh, thank you for taking us there uh, and uh, for joining us here in the studio. Isaac Stonefish of Strategy Risk. Always good to have you here. Thanks for having show. me. Speaking of Twitter, uh, some headlines just crossing now about Twitter's dispute with Elon Musk. Twitter dismissing Musk's complaints that he doesn't have enough information about spam and bot accounts. Twitter saying the complaints are a irrelevant, quote, sideshow, urging a judge to hold a trial as soon as possible over his proposed cancellation of this deal. We're expecting that hearing, the first hearing in this legal saga, Tuesday. We'll be back with more of Bloomberg technology after this quick break. This is Bloomberg. Despite the major success of the latest season of Stranger Things, Netflix investors have been bracing for subscriber losses. Shares are down more than 60% this year as the streaming space gets more competitive and inflation has forced consumers to be more selective. But shares jump to kick off the week ahead of earnings. Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw covers all things streaming for us. So why are shares climbing ahead of what's expected to be a not-so-great report? optimism that things will be better than expected. You know, Netflix had forecast that they would lose 2 million subscribers in the quarter, which would be their worst quarter ever. Uh, it would also mean that for the year they would have lost 2.2 million. I think there's some optimism based on, on reporting and, and third-party analysis and just the, the kind of obvious success of, of Stranger Things that maybe they'll lose 500,000 or a million instead of 2 million. I also think that, you know, the last time around, Netflix reported earnings. They threw a lot of information at people, and they've done a better job over the last couple of months of trying to explain what some of that means. You know, there's been some talk about, you know, changing the, the binge-watching strategy, releasing episodes weekly, for example. Do you think there's a chance that could happen? I mean, I guess stranger things have happened, right? Pun intended. They're, yeah, they're already starting it uh, with 
with the release of Stranger Things and, and La Casa de Papel and Ozark, they've, they've gone with this batch approach where they'll release a season in two installments, say, instead of all at once. And I think you'll see a lot more of that or maybe in, in three. I don't think you'll ever see Netflix, or at least not anytime soon, go with kind of the weekly model that's been popularized in a lot of TV. But they are seeing a benefit in, say, releasing four to six episodes at a time uh, and then spacing it out because it reduces the number of people who are canceling if they know that they have the show that they like, that they're going to need to stick with Netflix for at least two or three months. Did, you know, they did that with Ozark, too. Has it worked? I mean, I, as a viewer, I found it incredibly frustrating. Well, that frustration is why they haven't done it until now, because they've conditioned all these people <laughs> to just get to watch it all at once. I think what you see based on some of the third party data, at least, and, and on the, the data that Netflix puts out, is there is a secondary spike in viewership. And that seems like a good thing if your desire is to make sure that people are coming back to Netflix on a regular basis. You know, there's also some reporting about Hulu growing more than even Disney Plus itself. And of course, Disney is a big stakeholder in Hulu. What are these clues telling us about what consumers want and what services are, you know, going to trump them all? Yeah, I mean, the, the important thing to keep in mind on that Hulu report is that it's specific to the U.S. Uh, and, so, and it's from a, a, a third party data. So D Hulu may be doing better than Disney Plus right now in the, in the U.S. Disney Plus is still larger than Hulu by a lot, especially worldwide. Hulu is only U.S. only. And so the question looming over Disney is, is are they going to end up buying Comcast out of it and folding it into Disney Plus? Do they want to keep it independent? That being said, Hulu's been on a really good streak of programming um, and is one of the reasons why you've seen Netflix stumble a bit is these other services, namely Disney Plus, HBO Max, and Apple TV Plus, and to some extent Hulu, have given consumers a lot of alternatives online. And I think it used to be that Netflix was the default for most people if they wanted to, to watch TV, at least if they wanted to stream, and that's just not the case anymore. Meantime, you've got Amazon coming out with Lord of the Rings, you know, long anticipated. Who stands to gain the most from, you know, a potential decline in Netflix subscribers? Is it Disney Plus? Is it Amazon? It'll probably be spread across a number of players. You know, Disney has already benefited a bunch and, and hopes to continue to do so. HBO Max has been in a, a really good groove with programming and has grown at a steady clip. You know, Paramount uh, is, is actually one of the fastest growing services, at least in the U.S. You know, Amazon's been at it for as long as Netflix and has really, you know, been a second or third fiddle to them the whole time. They are trying to, to kind of get their act together. Lord of the Rings is the biggest swing, and they certainly hope that that works. At the same time, you've got another tech giant in, in Apple that some would argue has done a better job of programming over the last couple of years. All right. Well, lots to keep watching with Netflix results out later this week. Our very own Lucas Shaw. Thank you, Lucas, as always, for joining us. Well, next to streaming, one of the industries perhaps most profoundly changed by the pandemic has been healthcare, accelerating the progress of telemedicine and more. Able Partners is a women-led investment fund supporting early stage brands that focus on making the daily lives of consumers happier and healthier. And they just ran a study on how Gen Z in particular is navigating the new complexities of healthcare. Founding partner Amanda Illion joins me now. Amanda, thank you so much for being here. So talk to us about this report and what surprised you most about Gen Z. Well, thanks for having me, Emily. I think the most surprising finding by far is the fact that this generation, Gen Z, they might not want to go back to the office full time, but they seem to want to see their healthcare providers in person. When we asked them their preferred communication method for their healthcare providers, they chose in-person communication well above any other form of communication. And looked at another way, we asked them their top criteria when choosing a healthcare provider, and they chose convenient location as their top criteria, and telehealth capabilities were actually last in the survey. So when you look at the amount of funding, yeah. So does that mean <laughs> we sh you should be investing less in telehealth? Well, I think when we dig a little deeper into those findings, we find that the preference is really for a hybrid solution. 
So while they, they want to meet their healthcare provider in person, when we ask them how they want to, how often they want to hear back from their provider, the majority of respondents expect to hear back from providers within a few hours when they have a question or a concern. So they're really looking for the convenience of digital channels while still having the opportunity to make an in-person connection. So while I think it's true that the telehealth revolution has been oversold for this generation, there is a role for it. And I think when you start looking at specific specialties, perhaps mental health care, there could be even a larger role. So healthcare is operating in not just a post COVID, but also now a post row world. What are the trends that stem from that? Well, when we think about the impact of the Dobbs decision, that obviously has the largest impact directly on providers of telehealth abortions. And they've seen increase in demand as well as increased risks and liabilities as a result of that decision. But when you think about the broader impact, it actually has the potential to make employment and investment more or less appealing in any number of states. So if you're in Austin or Miami, I think you, you have a recruiting disadvantage at this point. In our survey, we found that nearly half of Gen Z women were somewhat or very unlikely to take a job in a state that had restricted abortion rights. And that number was 30% for men. So when you're an employer and you're looking at potentially 40% of your future workforce not wanting to work in your state, it doesn't matter where you stand on the political divide, that's just a business decision. And so I, I think the secondary impact of that is we will see further move towards permanent work from home policies and companies that are able to optimize a distributed workforce will continue to have advantages. So how is all of this impacting where you, uh, as an investor, are putting your money? Well, at Able Partners, we're very focused on a concept that we call the wellness gap. And that's something that we define as the disconnect between measures of economic well-being. So GDP per capita, that has gone up and to the right on graphs. Uh, consumers have had more money in their pockets. But if you were to plot on that same graph measures of physical and emotional well-being, those have been stagnant to down. Uh, particularly over the past two decades, and that's created a literal gap in the graph. So we're most interested in funding the companies that are looking to close that gap. And we have a secondary lens that we like to look at of stigma, where we feel like conditions or communities have been underserved because of historical stigmas. And we know that that often creates large market opportunities. The wellness gap. Interesting. All right. Thank you so much for joining us to tell us all about it. Able Partners founding partner, Amanda Illion. Appreciate it. Coming up, Bitcoin and altcoins rallying after the June crypto wipeout. We're going to talk about why next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our crypto report and Bitcoin rallying to start the week at one point trading above $22,000 for the first time since early June and testing the upper bound of the tight range where it's been stuck for the last month. And smaller tokens or altcoins also having a good day, even outperforming Bitcoin. You can see here Ether extending a rally that began last week after developers of the Ethereum blockchain gave a target for their software update projected to lower the network's energy usage, the long-awaited merge, and other coins like Avalanche, Polygon, Cardano, all in the green. I want to talk about all this and more with Bloomberg's Hannah Miller. So Hannah, first of all, why are we seeing Bitcoin and other coins rallying right now? Yeah, well, there's been some space in between, uh, you know, this rally here and the freezing of withdrawals at Celsius, which we saw a huge downturn in price um, for cryptocurrencies uh, in mid-June. And Bitcoin is, you know, sparking traders' interest. There is hope that maybe they would, Bitcoin will break out of this $19,000 to $22,000 range. And for Ether, in particular among altcoins, news of the merge that can happen as soon as September uh, has really sparked interest in Ethereum again. And yet we had a guest last week that called Ethereum a giant Ponzi scheme. What do you make of that? 
Yeah, there's always going to be skepticism uh, in this industry. There are people who are concerned about the safety and the risks that, you know, DeFi poses to investors. Um, so with, especially in light of like the, what's happening with Celsius and what's happening with Bureau's Capital and the freezing of withdrawals at various crypto lenders, this has put a lot of people on edge within the industry. Let's talk about that. There are some new developments when it comes to Three Arrows, this you know big crypto hedge fund, as well as the Celsius bankruptcy, and you know all of this amidst calls for more regulation. Yes, uh, we have a fuller picture of what's happening here with the collapse of Three Arrows Capital. Um, we got a more detailed list today of creditors. And it's a pretty interesting list. There are some really big names in the industry on there, like Digital Currency Group. And also one of the co-founders of Three Hours Capital's wife actually has a, uh, has a claim in. So it's pretty interesting to see how interconnected this industry is. And we're still getting details emerging about uh, Celsius, about Three Hours Capital, and it, we're still untangling sort of this web here of what's happening. All right, Bloomberg's Hannah Miller. Hannah, thank you so much for all of those updates. Speaking of distressed crypto firms, the rise and fall of companies like Celsius and others has sparked calls for more legislation and regulation in the crypto space overall. Here's what Marty Chavez, vice chair and partner at Sixth Street and recently appointed as a member of the Alphabet board had to say about that earlier on Bloomberg Television. Regrettably, we usually wait until some calamity uh, before there is regulation. Mm -hmm. And the question is always, um, was this calamity big enough or does there need to be another leg down uh, before we have the appropriate regulation? My next guest who joins us now, Sheila Warren, is the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation and she founded the World Economic Forum's blockchain and digital assets team. So, Sheila, look, there have been a lot of big red flags, Celsius, three arrows. You heard what Marty Chavez there said there about regulation. Are we behind? Are we waiting for a calamity? I know that we're waiting for a calamity. I find that a bit dramatic. I mean, I think we've seen a number of cycles and waves in this industry. And you know, I've been in this space for seven years now, and this is not the first time we've seen uh, a big crash followed by a pretty quick rally. And I think you, you're, Hannah mentioned earlier that we are starting to see a little bit of that rally start to happen and more consumer confidence in these alternative assets. So, so I don't know that anyone's waiting for a calamity. I think there's been enough uh, attention placed on this industry. I would say unduly placed in some cases in this industry and skepticism around it that I think there's been a lot of attention already paid. What do you think is driving this rally? And how long does it last? I mean, it just seems <laughs> to be bad news everywhere else when it comes to the economy. Well, I think that's right. I think we're part of a, a broad, there's a broader market meltdown happening. And I actually think it's pretty profound that you're seeing these individual coins that are starting to kind of turn around and, and uh, and pick up a little bit. So, you know, Ethereum, I think Hannah, Hannah nailed it. I think it really is about the merge. It's the idea that this has been waiting a long time coming. You know, people have been talking about the merge since Ethereum was first launched. And the idea that there could be this transition from what's called proof of stake to proof of, from proof of work rather to proof of stake. Uh, I should note that is a 99.95% reduction in the use of energy. It's not just a 10% or 2% reduction. It's a massive reduction in energy. And energy has been a big talking point for some folks in this space. So I do think people are excited to see not even so much about the energy usage, but the fact that this major technology change can be achieved. Uh, it's complicated. It's really hard to do. The details and, the, and building these systems are, are so complex. But here we are for the first time really seeing this massive change in the way that infrastructure is going to run. But I think it's kind of proof that, you know, you give it time, these things are going to thrive. I have to ask you then about the, the, these comments that we got last week from the founder of Tezos, who you know, basically called Ethereum a giant Ponzi scheme. I mean, you've got major skeptics, not just outside the industry, but inside the industry who don't believe in it. So I think one thing that's important to note about crypto is it tends to be pretty tribal. So you do have folks that have kind of picked their token, they've picked their team, and they're going to talk about their team as being the best team. And look, I mean, we're at a stage of innovation, like with any industry, there are a bunch of options, they have some similarities, they have some differences, in some cases, pretty significant differences. And, you know, I'm agnostic about this. I don't know, the market's going to decide which of these things winds up being really sticky and taking off and which doesn't. I think it's natural to have contraction, natural to have some of these things are going to fail, right? Some are going to grow. So it's normal 
normal to me to see somebody who might be favoring a different opportunity, talking about other opportunities with a negative frame. And, and I think you'll see that this happens quite a bit in the industry as people talk about uh, projects that aren't theirs. Tribalism indeed. Where are you on the big debate about whether crypto is a, is a security or a commodity? Because obviously that has major implications for how all of this is regulated and invested in. Yeah, this is, I think, the debate of the age right now. And you're seeing a lot of activity on the Hill, uh, also with Mika and the European Parliament in Europe about this about this topic as well, kind of defining like what is the classification of this asset, which will determine not only who regulates it, but some of the rules of engagement. What are you allowed to do? How onerous are disclosures? When do they happen? You know, all that kind of thing. And will shape the way this really continues to develop. So, so my view is that most things do start off, I think, to some degree uh, in a somewhat centralized fashion, simply because you do have a group of people who are engaging um, in that build. But I do think we've seen several that over time have really evolved to be pretty decentralized. Now, the Howey test, which is what determines whether or not something is a security, uh, does have a prong that talks about the engagement of others, right? How much does the activity of uh, one or a group of people really uh, affect uh, the, the effort, their efforts? How does that affect the nature of the build of the project, of the, of the price, of all those kinds of things? And in decentralized systems, there's an argument to be made that's really strong that there is not such engagement from any individual or even group that's going to affect uh, the way that the thing tends to tends to land, tends to grow, tends to be shaped. And so I do right. think we've had pretty you know pretty strong idea of Bitcoin and ETH are commodities, other things being developed and, and, and happening right now. But we're going to get to a place I think where more and more decentralization is the is the norm. All right, well, we will be watching uh, every twist and turn to see how that debate plays out. Crypto Council for Innovation CEO Sheila Warren. Sheila, great to have you back here on the show. Coming up, Twitter responds to Elon Musk. Oh, and the judge that was, that was supposed to run this hearing, this big hearing, coming up has COVID. This is Bloomberg. It is a big week for the courts and the integrity of M&A. Twitter has responded to Elon Musk ahead of Tuesday's big hearing. Bloomberg's Jeff Feely joins us now from Wilmington, Delaware, where this hearing will go down. And Jeff, who joins us now on the phone, Elon Musk responded to Twitter's suit saying he needed more time uh, to, to prove his argument in court, that Twitter was trying to rush and obfuscate things. Twitter has now responded to what Elon Musk had to say. Where do things stand right now? Well, you know, it's just a battle of uh, two sides. Uh, Twitter today basically said that Mr. Musk's uh, arguments that they hadn't turned over enough uh, information on the spam and robot bots within their customer base uh, was, quote, basically irrelevant, an irrelevant sideshow, close quote, that he knew all along how many bots there were and that this is a pretext to walk away. Um, basically, we're, we're at the stage now where the judge is going to have to decide uh, whether to fast track it and, you know, go for a trial in September or trial in February or somewhere in between. Now, in another twist, the judge who's going to run this hearing actually has COVID. So the hearing, as I understand it, was supposed to be in person, is still going to happen, but it's going to be on Zoom. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We've had a little boom let down here of the new variant. So... Judge uh, Judge sent a letter out today saying she had been she tested positive. We uh, we're pretty pretty uh, familiar with this. We did we did Zoom hearings for the better part of two years down here, so it'll be fine. So what exactly is going to happen at this hearing? What will the judge decide? So Twitter has asked to basically what's called fast track its lawsuit, and uh, you know I, that doesn't give you any specifics in terms of how fast, but it means months rather than years. And Twitter says that every day that passes with the cloud over its shares is harming the company's value. So that's why they're pushing for a, uh, a, a sped up trial for September 19th. Mr. Musk, on the other hand, says that the case is way too complicated to try to compress uh, discovery, pretrial information exchanges to that kind of uh, uh, period, and it really needs, you know, uh, to be spread out to the trial should be held in February of next year. My suspicion is the judge will come down somewhere between those two um, dates. Hmm. What 
are experts telling you thus far about whose case is stronger? Quickly. Again, it is it is a question that will be decided by Kathleen McCormick. Many people believe that Twitter holds the stronger hand because uh, Mr. M Mr. Musk waived uh, due diligence on the bots before he signed the deal. Um, but you just never know. Things have to develop. Uh, there may be things that we don't know at this point. That's why they have two sides to every court case. Two sides indeed. Jeff Feely, Bloomberg News in Delaware, who will be covering this hearing for us. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, as always, we'll stay tuned to your reporting. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from Gerber Kawasaki CEO Ross Gerber, big investor in Netflix and Tesla. He'll help us break down Netflix results. And as always, don't forget to check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.